Loving Father in heaven, tonight we want to thank you for your many blessings to us. We want to thank you for the privilege that we have of coming together that we might study your word. And Father, as we begin this series of studies on the prophecies of the Bible, I would ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit here tonight. Give us special spiritual understanding of your word. And Father, as you give us understanding, I pray that you would also give us open hearts, that we will be open to your will for our lives. I pray this, Father, that you would send your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight, our topic is the future's secrets revealed. Seems like everyone wants to know something about the future, and as we study tonight, we will learn from a prophecy of the book of Daniel. A prophecy that was given to an ancient king that reveals the future even to our day. We're going to start in an interesting text tonight in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, Surely the Lord God does how much? That's right, does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. What this is telling us is that before God will do anything here on earth, First of all, he will inform his servants, the prophets. The reason that he does that is so that they in turn might inform those who are the followers of God so that we can know that God truly is in charge. And if you don't get anything else out of tonight's presentation, I hope that you will get this one point. Our God is in charge here on planet Earth. Yes, everyone seems to want to know about the future, and people go to various sources to learn about the future. But in the prophecies of the Bible, what we have is the prophets holding back the curtain so that we can see down through the windows of time, and we can have this sure word of prophecy. However, there are many other places that people try to go to find out about the future, like to the occult, the prophecies of Nostradamus. Uh, Nostradamus wants you, his prayer you must say on August 15 to save the world. Actually, I picked this up this past August. And I don't know about you, but I didn't say the prayer on August 15. Did any of you say the prayer? I don't see any hands. And the good news is the world is still here, isn't it? Even if we didn't say that prayer. Well, there's all kinds of different ones that are out there saying that they can inform us about the future. A number of years ago, These Times Magazine did a survey of the supermarket psychics. You know those supermarket psychics, how you go through the checkout stand at the end of the year and all the tabloids have their predictions for the coming year? What they did is they surveyed the accuracy of those predictions. Here's what they discovered. The average leading psychic accuracy is only 16%. Folks, that's not a very good average. Notice what it says in Isaiah 47, beginning in verse 13. It says, You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from these things that shall come upon you. Notice that there are astrologers astrologers, stargazers, monthly prognosticators that here in the Old Testament we're warned about. We still have those around today. Today, though, generally we just refer to them as psychics. And we're told to stay away from them. Notice our next verse in verse 14. It says, Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. And the point is, folks, if they can't save themselves, why would we want to listen to what they have to say to us? And so what we need to understand is there are better places to go. Where can we look for answers concerning the future? Well, the writings of Muhammad contain no prophecy. And it's true that the writings of Buddha offer nothing about prophecy, and likewise, the writings of Confucius are lacking in prophecy. But when it comes to the Bible, the good news is that 30% of the Bible is prophecy. Indeed, Bible prophecy reveals the future so that we can see God's hand and that we can see his leading down through the ages. I want to take you to Isaiah 48 
verse 3 says, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them and they came to pass. In verse 5 God goes on and says, Even from the beginning I have declared it to you. Before it came to pass I proclaimed it to you, lest you should say, My idol has done them and my carved image and my molded image have commanded them. Now what God is telling us here is that way back at the beginning of time, he knew what would take place down at the end of time. And what he does is he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets, so that they in turn can reveal it to us, not necessarily so we can figure out everything in advance, but rather so that when it comes to pass, we can know that God has already predicted it and that God truly is in charge, that he is in control of the events here on planet Earth. And I'm thankful for the fact that he is in control here on planet Earth. You know, we are living in a time of uncertainty. With the scenes imprinted upon our minds from September 11th, you see, when the Twin Towers in New York were attacked, and with all of the terror that is in our world today, there's much uncertainty. There's in uncertainty in various places of the world. We're worried about various nations and their nuclear potential. Uh, we're worried about all kinds of things, and now we're trying to deal with the situation in Iraq and Baghdad trying to get that under control but the good news is that God always has it under control and there is a place that we can go to find a sense of security and peace and that is to go to the prophecies of God's word. Before we get to our prophecy from the book of Daniel tonight, I want to take you to the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. It says, we also have the prophetic word made more sure which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, you see there's something we need to know first, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now we're going to come back to this and talk about how we can avoid private interpretation. Verse 21 says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by whom, folks? That's right, by the Holy Spirit. That's why every night when we get started, we'll be praying for the guidance of God's Holy Spirit. You see... The Bible was not given to us because some men got their heads together and said, let's write something down. No, over a span of centuries, we have various holy men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit and they communicated the message that God gave them for us so that we can know that God is in charge. Now we're going to talk about how we can avoid a private interpretation. And to do that, what I want to do is kind of tell you a little bit of a story from my boyhood just for a little bit. I grew up in Northern California, way up on the north coast of California, almost up to the Oregon border. When my parents moved there, they moved there well before I was born, and they bought 40 acres. And at first my father farmed Easter lilies, and later on he got a job and worked as a carpenter. But uh, when I was born, uh, they had already sold 20 acres and they owned 20 acres. And then I remember as a boy that my dad sold 10 of those acres and I went out to help him with building a fence to divide the 10 acres that we were selling from the 10 acres that we were keeping. Now, when you divide two 10-acre plots of land, folks, and put a fence across, that's a pretty long fence, isn't that right? And I can remember going out there with him to help him find the place to build that fence. And what we did is my dad found the place over on one side where he knew to put the post. And then he found the place over on the other side to put the post. But we didn't have a line long enough to run. So what my dad did is he got over to the side. He put me out there with a post hole digger in the middle. And he eyed from one side to the other and had me move until it was just in the right place. Then he came over. He dug the hole. And uh, then once again I put the post in that hole and he came back and eyed it while he moved it around a little bit and then he came and he put the earth around it, tamped it down and sure enough 
we could run the line from that place back over to the post on the edge and then we were able to line up the posts. Now, what does this have to do with Bible study? Well, first of all, let me ask this question. How many posts do you have to have in order to have a fence? What's the minimum number of posts that w is required? That's right. Two posts is the minimum. But think about it, folks. If you're going to have a fence to divide 10 acres from 10 acres, two posts isn't going to make a very good fence. Am I correct? That's right. It's just not going to make it. It's going to drag the ground almost all the way, isn't it? And my point is here that one post does not a fence make. Now, when it comes to the study of God's Word, I want to suggest to you as well that one Bible verse does not a theology build. Have you ever heard people say, when it comes to the, uh, the understanding of God's Word, that it's all in how you interpret it? Have you ever heard that? And you know, what the problem is, is often people will take one Bible verse. And somebody will say, well, you know, I'm looking at that Bible verse from this perspective, and it's pointing me in this direction. Somebody else might say, no, I think you're wrong, because after all, I'm looking at it from another perspective, and it's pointing me in this direction. And somebody else might say, you're both wrong. I'm looking at it from this perspective, and it's pointing me in this direction. And pretty soon what you have is you have half a a dozen different people or different organizations all gathered around one Bible verse all pointing in some different direction and that's why there's so many different private interpretations and why so many people say well it's all in how you interpret it well you see what we need to do is we need to stay away from interpreting in ourselves and the way to stay away from interpreting the Bible ourselves is to gather as many Bible verses as we can from throughout the scriptures on a particular topic and then just begin to read those Bible verses and what you will discover is that those Bible verses will line themselves up and they will point the way to truth for us. So the way to avoid that private interpretation then is to get as many Bible verses as you can and let the Bible interpret itself as these Bible verses will line up and point the way to truth. Now, if we have a whole bunch of Bible verses on a topic pointed in one direction and we have another verse pointing off in some other direction, you know what that means? It means we probably have a misunderstanding of that other Bible verse because the Bible is always in agreement with itself. Now, the point being that that other Bible verse might not even really have anything to do with the topic under consideration. And if that's true, then if we're trying to make it fit that, then we truly do have a misunderstanding of that. So in this series of meetings, what we're going to do is we're going to spend time each night reading a number of Bible verses. That's why we show the Bible verses on the screen, is because we want to line up Scripture. We want the Scripture to reveal truth to us. I don't want you going out of here saying, well, Dale Paulett says. I want you to go out of here saying the Word of God says. And by the way, that's why we give you an outline each night and put all of the Bible verses in it because we want you to go home, get out your Bibles and look up those Bible verses and check it out. Don't ever take my word for it. Check it out according to the Word of God. That's the way we avoid private interpretation. And so now we're ready to go to the book of Daniel, to a dream given to a heathen king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 verse 1. It says, now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream here and he woke up, his sleep left him, he knew it was an important dream and he wanted an interpretation. The problem was that the Bible says the dream left him. In other words, he couldn't remember what it was and so he called some psychic advisors that he had. Notice verse 2. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Notice that he calls the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, all of his psychic advisors, and he tells them, listen, I've had a dream, and I need you to give me the interpretation. And they said, king, no problem. You just tell us the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. Mm. Then... 
The king said, no, that's not going to happen because I don't remember what the dream was. So here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to tell me both the dream and the interpretation. And furthermore, if you can't do that, then I'm going to have all of you killed. Uh, they stalled for time. They were looking for some time, hoping that the king could come up with some sort of dream. And they would come up with an interpretation, I'm sure. But he said, no you got to come up with the dream and the interpretation. Now I want you to see something that they told the king. In verse 10, there's some truth in what they say here. Let's look at it. It says, The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requires, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except who, folks? Except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now what they told the king is this. They told him that it's, in order to accomplish what you are demanding, it's going to require supernatural ability. And they knew that they were not in contact with a source of supernatural power that was able to do what the king was demanding. So the command went out to execute them all. And the interesting thing is that Daniel and his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that you know better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they ha are just now coming to the end of their three-year training program as wise men in Babylon. And they are to be included among those who are slain. And so they ask Arioch, Daniel does, the captain of the king's guard, and he asks him, why is this command being carried out so hastily? And Arioch told him about the king's dream and that the wise men could not give an interpretation. And so Daniel asked for an audience with the king, and he went and spoke to the king. In verse 16 it says, So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. After all, that's what the king was, so he gave him the time. Notice what he did with that time in verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercy mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. I'd like to suggest that Daniel made good use of the time. What do you think? He went home and told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and together they prayed about it and God revealed the vision to him that night as well as the interpretation. So he goes back along with his three companions to Nebuchadnezzar to tell him what he has learned. Notice what the king asks him. In verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, that's his Babylonian name, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? He says to Daniel, Daniel, are you able to give me the dream and the interpretation? Now, before Daniel informs the king where he learned about the dream and the interpretation, he gives the king just a little reminder of how his psychic advisors were not up to the challenge. You see, they couldn't come up with the dream or the interpretation. And we need to understand something here. We need to understand that psychics today, their power and their ability really is limited. It reminds me, I was in one city, I forget where it was, but a young man came to me and, and mentioned the Psychic Friends Network. Have you ever noticed, you know, they used to advertise on the TV a, a lot, and he says, have you heard about them lately? And I said, actually, I haven't seen them advertising on TV for quite some time. And he said, you know why that is? I said, no. He says, well, they went bankrupt. And then he said to me, he says, you would have thought they would have foreseen that. And, and that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Surely, if they could have good information and predict the future, they should have been able to foresee that. But you see, uh, psychics today are no different from the ones back here in uh, Daniel's day and in Nebuchadnezzar's day. They can't come up with these things, you see. Now, 
he informs the king where he gets the information. In verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Now, I want you to notice that he says that there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And here he says that he has made known to the king what will be in the latter days. Now, this particular dream or vision that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had has a fulfillment that begins in his day and will stretch all the way to the latter days indeed to the time when the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So it truly is a prophecy that spans the centuries of history, you see, from Nebuchadnezzar's day right up to when God will set up his kingdom. And so he begins to give him a description in verse 31 of what it was that he saw. He said, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image, whose head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so he told him about this great image that he had seen it had a head of gold and then it had chest and arms of silver its belly and thighs were made of bronze it had legs made of iron its feet were part of iron and part of clay and he watched till a stone cut out of a mountain without hands crashed into the feet of that image when it crashed into the feet of the image it scattered those pieces of metal everywhere and then it grew and it filled the whole earth and so he shared with him what it was that he saw and then he begins to give him the fulfillment of what all of that was to represent what is this great image in Daniel chapter 2 representing this great metal man of Daniel chapter 2? Well, Daniel begins to give the interpretation. In verse 36, he says, This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Now, how is the king going to know that he's getting the right interpretation? Because I have a feeling that as Daniel is revealing the dream that he's forgotten, that it's probably all coming back to him. Him. It's probably like he's going, yeah, yeah, that's what I saw. Yeah, that's what I saw. And when he's heard the whole description of what he's seen, he knows he's going to get the right interpretation now. What is that interpretation? Notice in verse 37, Daniel begins. He says, you, O king, are a king of kings. Now I have a feeling Nebuchadnezzar likes what he hears here. What do you think? You, O king, are a king of kings. But notice what he says next about how he got this kingdom. Let's look at it. It says, For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You see, he says, You are a king of kings, but he says, It's the God of heaven that has given you this kingdom, power, and glory. And see, Nebuchadnezzar thought it was great Babylon that he had built. But it was given to him by who, folks? It was given to him by the God of heaven. In verse 38, he goes on to say, And wherever the children of men dwell are the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. And then he says, You are this head of gold. The head of gold of that great image, you see, was to represent the kingdom of Babylon that came on the scene in about the year 605-606 B.C. And so the head of gold represents not 
just Nebuchadnezzar. It represents the kingdom of Babylon because we're going to come back and read how he predicts another kingdom to arise after him. History reveals that the next kingdom that arises arises well after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. So the head of gold, even though it says you are this head of gold, represents more than just Nebuchadnezzar. It represents his kingdom is what it represents let's go on back to the verse in verse 39 notice it says but after you shall arise what folks another kingdom inferior to yours and so these different metals represent the various kingdoms that would arise first Babylon in the year 605 BC and then Medo-Persia in the year 539 BC you see history reveals that this was the succession of kings and of kingdoms how could it be that an inferior kingdom would be able to defeat a superior kingdom well we find uh, the story of how it happened recorded for us in Daniel chapter 5 in Daniel chapter 5 we find that Belshazzar is the king now in Babylon actually he's the second ruler in the kingdom his father Nabonidus is still alive he's the first ruler he's simply chosen not to rule in the city of Babylon and so here is um, Belshazzar as the king in Babylon and the Medes and Persians have already come to surround the city of Babylon which was a great walled city with two great walls around it and the way that you would conquer a city with these great walls back in uh, biblical times was to lay a siege upon the city where you surrounded them cut them off from the outside world hoping that they will run out of food and water and they'll have to finally surrender well, the archaeologists have suggested that this would have been a difficult thing to do with the city of Babylon since the river Euphrates flowed through the city and since they could have plenty of food inside the city and store it up, uh, they have estimated at least enough to last about 10 years. And so it would be very difficult to do that. And so what Belshazzar has done is he has had a night where while the siege is in place he has a party in his palace for all of his nobles in the midst of this party for his nobles probably to assure them that everything's under control don't worry he commands for the sacred vessels that had been taken captive from the temple in Jerusalem to be brought in and they begin to drink their wine out of those sacred vessels in the midst of all of this there appears a hand writing on the wall just a hand writing on the wall and it really shook him up in fact the King James Version says that his knees smote together that's how shook up he was about that and there he saw the handwriting on the wall and he called for his magicians and Chaldeans and astrologers all of his psychics he brought them in and asked for an interpretation of what was on the wall and nobody could give the interpretation until somebody remembered you know when Nebuchadnezzar was king whenever he had something that troubled him there was a man by the name of Daniel that he would call and Daniel always seemed to be able to come up with an interpretation and so they brought Daniel in and when he brought Daniel in he told Daniel if you can give me the interpretation I will make you the third ruler in the kingdom Daniel says well you can keep that but I'll give you an interpretation and actually it was an interpretation of a riddle let's look at it here in Daniel 5 verse 25 it says and this is the inscription that was written meeny meeny tekel you farson this is the interpretation of each word meeny God has numbered your kingdom and finished it tekel you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting Perries, your kingdom has been divided and given to whom, folks? To the Medes and the Persians. And where are the Medes and the Persians? Hmm? They're right outside the city, aren't they? Now, notice what the next verse says. 
That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. You see, Belshazzar didn't have to wait long for this prophecy to be fulfilled, did he? That very night it happened, Belshazzar was slain. But how could this be accomplished? Well, there's a clue that's given to us in the prophecy of the book of Isaiah, chapter 45 and verse 1. Notice it. It says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him. Now, actually, Cyrus was the general leading the armies of the Medes and the Persians that night outside the city of Babylon. And notice that Isaiah named Cyrus here as God's anointed to accomplish his purpose. Notice the last part of the verse. And loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. And here it even shows something about how it would be accomplished. The amazing thing is that Cyrus was named approximately 150 years before his birth as God's anointed to accomplish his purpose. And it even shares how it would be happening. Loose the armor of kings. You know, that night when they were getting drunk, they were letting their guard down. They weren't being very vigilant. They thought, with two great walls, how could anybody possibly conquer us? And because of pride and arrogance, they became lax, you see. Uh, but also it said that the gates would be left open. How did that happen? Well, let's share a little bit of the story. You see, while there was this great walled city, they had gates in the wall to keep people from coming in and to keep ships from coming in on uh, the river Euphrates into the city and soldiers coming in that way. They had actual gates that went down into the water. But what had happened was... While the party was going on, Cyrus and his men were working upstream. And what they had done was they had diverted the waters of the Euphrates River into a basin area where the water dropped to about ankle depth in the riverbed. And so the soldiers of the Medes and Persians just marched down into the riverbed, w marched right under that first wall. When they got under the first wall, lo and behold, they discovered that the gate in the second wall had been left wide open. Open. There was very little bloodshed that night. Yes, uh, Belshazzar was slain. Darius the Mede was made king in Babylon at that time. And here's something very interesting. Belshazzar had fulfilled his promise and had made Daniel third ruler in the kingdom. And so when Darius takes over he finds Daniel there and uses him for his advisor isn't that really interesting now do you notice God's hand here who was it that gave to Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom it was the God of heaven but when God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to have charge over the children of Israel, his people. What he did is he gave that heathen king a dream to help him know who truly was in charge, a dream that he caused him to forget so that only Daniel could give an interpretation so that Daniel would be a close advisor to him because God wants Nebuchadnezzar to know who's in charge. And it's real interesting as the Medes and Persians are about to come to power the second kingdom here in this prophecy that is identified. It's very interesting that God puts a writing on the wall, a riddle that only Daniel can interpret so that he's put back in a place of prominence to have influence with the new king that is coming with the new kingdom. Isn't that kind of interesting to see how it all works and how God is always in charge and how he is at work in this whole situation and so we find a second kingdom that has arisen at this point the kingdom of Medo-Persia but I want to talk with you a moment about Iraq on the march this was the Time magazine uh, issue of August in August of 1990 do you remember, you know, Saddam Hussein shortly after this issue came out invaded the country of Kuwait. And in this issue they talked about how Nebuchadnezzar fancied himself to be a modern day Nebuchadnezzar. And he wanted his kingdom to be as glorious as that of the kingdom of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And in fact he had himself photographed in the war chariot similar to that of Nebuchadnezzar. And in fact, he had built a palace on an artificial hill overlooking the ancient site of the city of Babylon. 
because it's only about 30, 35 miles south of the city of Baghdad. And he had a palace built there, and there was renovation going on there where they were doing some work, restoring some of the things so that tourists were coming there and so on and so forth. Um, and it leads me to a book that I got a few years ago, this book by... Charles H. Dyer, The Rise of Babylon's Sign of the End Times, was written back in the 1980s. I've recently gotten a revision of that book as well. The end set up at the top of the page, we'll make it a little larger so it's easier to read. Startling photos from Iraq reveal that Saddam Hussein is rebuilding the lost city of Babylon. The Bible says Babylon will be rebuilt in the last days. Could ours be the last generation? Now these are interesting things and interesting questions and it is, it's an interesting speculation as well. But what I want us to do is focus on that second statement up there where it says the Bible says Babylon will be rebuilt in the last days. Now it is true that in the book of Revelation we find that there will be an end time Babylon. Now, what we want to know is this. The end time Babylon identified in the book of Revelation is that to be a rebuilding of that literal city of Babylon over there in the country of Iraq, or is that end time Babylon something else with symbolic significance? Now, right now, we don't have enough information to help us with that. We need more biblical information. To do that, let's go back to the prophecy of Isaiah. In chapter 13, verse 19, it says, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew what cities, folks? Sodom and Gomorrah. Have Sodom and Gomorrah been overthrown? Yes. Have they ever been rebuilt? Well, no, they haven't. Notice what it says as we go on. It says it will never be inhabited. So how soon will the city of Babylon be inhabited? What does it say? Never. How do we know? Well, the Bible says it. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The hyenas will howl in their citadels, and jackals in their pleasant palaces. Her time is what, folks? Is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. So Isaiah in his day said about Babylon that it would be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, and that her days were near to come in his day, not very far off, and that it will never be inhabited. So when we come to the end time Babylon in the book of Revelation, are we to understand that end time Babylon to be a rebuilding of that city, that ancient city of Babylon over in the country of Iraq? Of course not. Why, how do we know that? Because other scriptures preclude that possibility. So since a rebuilding of the literal city is precluded by other scriptures, what we need to understand is that the end time Babylon must be an end time Babylon with symbolic significance. Oh, we'll use that information later on when we come to study about end time Babylon. Well, let's come back to our prophecy here. Here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 39, the last part of the verse says, Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. So what does history reveal about a third kingdom to come after Medo-Persia? Well, history reveals that the next kingdom on the scene was the kingdom of Greece that came to power in the year 331 B.C. as it came to power at the Battle of Arbella. Under the direction of a man by the name of Alexander the Great. Now I want you to notice something here that the historians have to say about Alexander the Great in Historical Library Book 16 Chapter 12. It says, I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. Now folks, that wouldn't surprise me none. You know why? Well, because after all, 
God was the one who gave the kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar. God was the one who named Cyrus as his anointed to accomplish his purpose. So it wouldn't surprise me that God is involved in bringing to existence this third kingdom, the kingdom of Greece, you see. But it doesn't stop here. Notice what Scripture predicts next in verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. You know, the legs were made of iron. Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters all things, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. It would be a cruel kingdom when it comes to power. History reveals that Rome was the kingdom that came to power next in the year 168 B.C., and it was a rather cruel kingdom as it came to power, crushing all opposition against its kingdom and so Rome, a fourth kingdom, comes to power. And we found this succession of kingdoms, starting with Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then Rome. So four kingdoms thus far. What does the prophecy predict next? Before we come to that, let's notice what the historian has to say about the kingdom of Rome. Edward Gibbon, in his History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 1, page 643, said, The image of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. And so it appears that Edward Gibbon is familiar with this particular prophecy of Scripture. What do you think? Isn't that kind of interesting to see that? And so what we find is that indeed we've got these four kingdoms, and here's the fourth one, the kingdom of Rome. What is it that comes next? Daniel 2, verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be what, folks? Shall be divided. Now let's stop here just for a moment. When it says the kingdom shall be divided, what kingdom is the prophecy speaking of? Oh, it's the fourth kingdom, the kingdom identified as the kingdom of Rome. Now, has the fourth kingdom come to power? Yes, it has. Has Rome come to power? Yes. And Rome was not to be conquered. You see, when Medo-Persia took over, they conquered the Babylonians. When Greece took over, they conquered the Persians. And when Rome took over, they conquered the Greeks. But the interesting thing is, Rome was not to be conquered. It would simply be divided okay this kingdom would be divided let's come back to this and notice it says yet the strength of the iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay and so the division of the Roman Empire is represented by the feet and toes partly of iron and partly of clay that division of the Roman Empire was complete by the year 476 AD this is something that history reveals to us and I'm going to share with you tonight these ten kingdoms, how they were known then and how we know them now. You won't have to write them down. You'll find them in your outline that you'll receive on the way out. How were they known then? How do we know them now? Well, here's the list. The Almani we know as Germany. The Lombards we know as Italy. The Franks we know as France. The Burgundians we know as Switzerland. The Suevi we know as Portugal. The Visigoths we know as Spain. The Anglo-Saxons we know as England. The Heruli were destroyed. The Vandals also destroyed. And the Ostrogoths, a third of three of the original ten that were later destroyed. And oh, by the way, don't miss coming up on Thursday night when we study about the Antichrist beast of revelation we'll find out how when and why these three were destroyed but notice that it said some of them would be strong and some of them would be fragile some are iron some are clay notice that some of them are destroyed you see and some of them even remain today Daniel 2 verse 42 says this and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now let's look at the first part of this. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men. Actually, there would be many attempts to unite the divided Roman Empire. 
And this is actually talking about one of those attempts to unite Europe, the mingling with the seed of men. What is that all about anyway? Well, it's kind of interesting. You can go to Denmark and go there to the Fredericksburg Castle. And if you go inside the castle there, you can find a mural on the wall that depicts how the various heads of state were interrelated through the marriage of King Frederick and Queen Diana of Denmark. At that time, all of the heads of state in Europe Europe were interrelated. One historian has suggested that World War I was nothing but a great big family feud. That might be a little bit simplistic, but that's kind of one historian's approach to it. Some of you are probably familiar with the fact that Napoleon divorced Josephine in order to marry uh, the daughter of the king of Austria, trying to unite Europe through the mingling with the seed of men. But would this attempt be successful? Now, while it says they will mingle with the seed of men, let's notice again the last half of the verse and read it out loud together. It says, But they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And so the Bible is real clear that the fourth kingdom would be divided, but yet once divided, it would never again be united. There's been many attempts like Charlemagne with the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V tried to unite Europe, as did Louis XIV of France, and Napoleon really wanted to unite Europe. In The Watchman, August 1941, uh, Napoleon is quoted, I wanted to found a European system, a European code of law, a European court of appeals. Sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it, folks? There would have been but one people throughout Europe. Europe would soon have become one nation. Now, this was the goal of Napoleon to unite all of Europe. Was he successful? Well, no, he wasn't. What stopped him? Well, it looked like he was going to be successful as he swept into Russia. But what stopped him? was something really small. It was a little snowflake. Actually, it was a whole bunch of snowflakes. And it got cold, and his army got sick, and it ended right there. Now notice what this historian, a uh, lecture on modern history by Arnold, has to say. The deliverance of Europe from the dominion of Napoleon was effected neither by Russia nor by Germany nor by England, but by the hand of God. Yeah, God put a stop to it. Why? Because he had predicted in his word that even though the Roman Empire would be divided, it would never again be united. They will not adhere to one another, it says. Hmm. Yeah, there have been other attempts. Kaiser Wilhelm wanted to unite Europe, as did the League of Nations. That was supposed to unite Europe. Then there was Adolf Hitler who wanted to unite Europe. And then the United Nations, well, that's a misnomer, isn't it? Uh, the United Nations are trying to unite all of the nations of the world. But the Bible says they shall not adhere to one another. Pat Robertson in his book, The New World Order, said it this way on page 3 of his book. He said, in 1992, the European community will emerge as the possible forerunner of the United States of Europe. And this is a popular concept today, that the European community is going to unite Europe. In fact, I hear a lot of preachers make this statement. But I want you to notice once again what the Scripture says about it. In Daniel 2, verse 43, As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And so the Bible is real clear. It tells us that when Rome is divided, once it is divided, it will never be united because it says they will not adhere to one another I was in Wilmington back in 1993 and when I finished this presentation I went out into the hallway and there was a lady who came to me to talk with me and I'd never met her before and there was a young man standing by I'd never met him before and as she came to me I could tell she was in earnest with great concern in her voice she said do you mean to tell me that the European community will not unite Europe before I could say a word, the young man standing by, he said, No, he's not telling you that. The Bible's telling you that. 
And I thought that was a pretty good answer, and I kind of left it at that. And I said, you know, I can only go with what the Scripture says. And here's an important point, folks. We need to understand this point. The Bible doesn't care what the popular opinion is. The Bible simply shares truth for us, doesn't it? And so what we have seen here now is that there would be a progression of four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and then the fourth kingdom, Rome, would be divided. Has the fourth kingdom come to power? Yes. Has the fourth kingdom been divided? Yes. History reveals that for us. And oh, by the way, do you see the relationship between Bible prophecy and history? You see, what Bible prophecy does is it actually predicts history in advance. And then when we study prophecy and study history, history is an unfolding and a revealing of the prophecy that God has given. Have you noticed how the prophecy and the history of this world fit together so very well? And that's why it's troubling sometimes in some of the popular books. I've, in fact, I read one particular author who said this. He said, I don't want history to tell me anything about Bible prophecy. When I read that, I thought to myself, does he really want to be ignorant about what Bible prophecy teaches? You see, the two go together, and you can't really fully understand one without the other, and it's so very, very important. Well, where are we now in history? In the vision, we're past the legs of iron. We're down into the feet and toes made up of iron and clay. We're out on the toes. Maybe I should say we're out on the toenails. I believe we're really in the very last days. Here's what it says in Daniel 2, verse 44. It says, and in the days of these kings. What it means is in the days of the division. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand, how long, folks? It shall stand forever. I don't know about you, but if you're looking for a kingdom where peace will prevail, this is the kingdom you want. This is the only kingdom that's going to bring, bring unity throughout the world, the kingdom that God will establish. And I want you to notice what the scripture has said here. It tells us that it will be established in the days of these kingdoms. It's represented by the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. That represents God's kingdom. It is established in the days of these kings. We don't know the date, but it's during the time of the division. And Rome is still divided today. Isn't that right? And the scripture reveals that it will still be divided when God sets up his kingdom. Hmm. Here's an important point for us to understand. The important point I want you to see is, you know, there are a lot of people who predict that before God can set up his kingdom, that first of all, there must be a revival of the Roman Empire. Have any of you ever heard that before? Yeah. I see a lot of heads going up and down, yes. In fact, I hear a lot of preachers who are predicting that. A lot of the popular books on end-time Bible prophecy are predicting that. But like I said, folks, the Bible doesn't care what the popular opinion is, okay? Have you found anything in this passage of Scripture that predicts a revival of the Roman Empire? No. It simply told us there would be four kingdoms. We've discovered them, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then the fourth kingdom, Rome, would be divided. And after that, the God of heaven, in the days of the division, in the days of these kings, that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. I want to take you briefly here to the book of Revelation. I want to give you some glimpses at some things we're going to be studying in the days ahead. Like here in Revelation 16 verse 13 it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And so we find here what I call Revelation's unholy trinity. We find the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we're going to see their role. And when we understand their role, we'll 
understand that we need to know who they are. We need an understanding of who the dragon is. We'll study about that tomorrow night. We need an understanding of who is represented by the beast of Revelation. We'll be studying about that coming up on Thursday night. Later on, we're going to study about the false prophet as well because we need these things. Here's what it says about them. For they are spirits of demons performing signs. They work miracles, folks, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now it's called here the battle of the great day of God Almighty. If it's the battle of the great day of God Almighty, who do you suppose might win? Yeah, the Almighty is going to win. Isn't that right? And notice that these three unclean spirits, this unholy trinity of the book of Revelation, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are involved in gathering the nations, it says, of the whole world together for that battle. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14, it talks about them saying these will make war with the Lamb. Actually, in the verse before this, it talks about the ten kingdoms saying these will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them oh it tells us who's going to win for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful and this is why I love to study the prophecies of the Bible is because the prophecies of the Bible reveal who's going to win it helps us to know which side to be on you see Oh, notice one other passage I want to share with you here very briefly. In Revelation chapter 19, we find a symbolic representation of the second coming of Jesus Christ when God comes to establish his kingdom. And uh, in this symbolic representation, Jesus is pictured as the rider of a white horse. I'm just going to look at one verse tonight. When we study next weekend about the rapture of the church and the return of Christ, we're going to come back and read this whole passage. But let's notice verse 19 of this chapter. It says, And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. You see, the... Nations of this world, the nations of the world that have been gathered together will be making war against the rider of the white horse, against the lamb who will overcome them. It's the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Indeed, God will prevail. Aren't you glad for that? Let's come back to our vision here in Daniel chapter 2. The stone cut out of the mountain without hands that represents God's kingdom it's to be established when in the days of these kings that means during the time of the division notice what we find in verse 45 Daniel says inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron the bronze the clay the silver and the gold the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this then he says the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. He says, you saw that stone cut out of the mountain without hands. You know what that means? It means that God's kingdom is going to be established without human devising. In fact, it's going to be established by God himself. In fact, as we have seen, God's hand has been in charge all along. Isn't that right? He gave Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom. We discovered that he named Cyrus as his anointed. And of course, he brought uh, Alexander to power. And he brought the snowstorm that stopped Napoleon. And God has always been in charge on planet Earth. After Nebuchadnezzar had heard the dream and the interpretation, you know what he said? Verse 47. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. You see, Nebuchadnezzar understood that Daniel's God truly was the God of gods and the Lord of kings. Why? Because he was the one who could reveal the secrets, not only of the dream, but the secrets of the future as well. And you see, we serve a wonderful God, a great and powerful God who is so powerful that he created the heavens. He put the earth in its place. He puts the stars in space. He put the planets in their orbit. And if he can do all that, and if he can control the destiny of nations here upon this earth, I'd like to suggest to you that he can also handle the problems that we might have in our lives. What do you think? If we've got problems with our job or problems with our relationships or 
problems with finances or whatever problems we have in our life, I'd like to suggest that we need to give them all to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's true that he's got the whole world in his hands. And you see, we need to let him truly take charge of all of our lives. It's interesting, I've seen a bumper sticker. I used to see it some years ago and I always wanted to get a hold of the people who had that bumper sticker because it said, God is my co-pilot. I wanted to get a hold of them and straighten them out and say, well, if God's in there with you, what's he doing in the second seat? I've seen a better bumper sticker. It says that God is my pilot. We need to let him take charge of our lives. But you know, he won't just arbitrarily come in and force his will. We need to allow him to take charge in our lives. We need to put him first because he's to be trusted. He can control the destiny of the nations and he is going to set up his kingdom in the days of these kings. I don't know the date, but I'm looking forward to it. How about you? Hmm. You see, Jesus Christ is going to come and he is going to set up that kingdom one of these days. A number of years ago, there was a preacher who was riding on a train, and as he was riding on the train, he noticed a young man sitting just ahead of him on the other aisle who was reading a book, and as the young man was reading the book, he noticed that every once in a while, this young man would just kind of stop what he was reading, and he'd kind of laugh out loud to himself, and then he'd hear him say, if you only knew what I know. And then he'd go on reading, and pretty soon he'd stop and laugh a little bit, shake his head and say, if you only knew what I know. After a while, the preacher couldn't stand it, so he got up and went over and tapped the young man on the shoulder and, to ask him about it. He says, I don't really mean to interrupt, but I noticed that you're reading a book. And the young man says, yeah, I've got this book. I picked it up back in the train station. I knew we had a long ride today. Uh, and uh, the preacher said to the young man, he says, well, if you don't mind, what kind of book is it anyway? He says, well, it's this Western novel I picked up. And he says, well, I really don't want to be nosy, but I've noticed every once in a while you stop reading, you laugh, you shake your head, and you say, if you only knew what I know, what's that all about anyway? He says, well, you know what happened? When I started reading this book, I read in the first chapter, and as I read in the first chapter, first chapter I discovered that the hero of the book comes to town to see his girl and as he comes to town to see his girl the bad guys are waiting for him and they beat him up and they throw a rope around his legs and they drag him behind a horse out into the desert and they leave him out there to die but somebody comes along and helps him get nursed back to a little bit of health and he comes back into town to see his girl again and in chapter 2 when he comes into town to see his girl lo and behold the bad guys are waiting for him again and they shoot him full of holes and they leave him to die and he says when I read those two chapters I said to myself my this is a gruesome book I wonder if it gets any better so he said what I did is I went over to the back of the book got in the last chapter I read down in even to the last paragraph and here's what I discovered I discovered that at the end of the story, the hero of the book is elected sheriff. He rounds up all the bad guys, puts them in prison, and then he marries his girl. And so he says, now when I'm reading the book, as I'm going through it, every time that the bad guys have the drop on the good guy, and it looks like it's all over for him, I just laugh and I say, if you only knew what I know. And you see, we need to have an approach where we understand this point. Even though it may look bad in this world, and even though it may look like the bad guy is winning, the reason we study the prophecies of the Bible is because they reveal who will ultimately prevail, and it's the God of heaven who can be trusted. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that we have the prophecies of the Bible? Sometimes people, as they approach the prophecies of the book of Revelation, they say, oh, well, they're scary. There's a lot of scary symbols there. But you know what I find in the last chapter of this book? I find that when we get through all of those symbols, the voice of Jesus speaks and says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. I'm looking forward to that day when Jesus is coming back, and I believe it's going to be soon and very soon. What about you? I'm looking forward to being in that kingdom. And, and oh, let me just say it this way. When it comes to the understanding of the prophecies, as we study them in the days ahead, I want to say to you, if you only knew what I know, 
There's hope in the prophecies of the Bible, in the prophecies of the book of Daniel, in the prophecies of the book of Revelation. There is hope for us. And so we're going to focus upon the hope that we find in God's Word. But you know what? I hope that you've learned this tonight. God is in charge and God can be trusted. How many of you with me tonight would just like to say to the God of heaven, God, I want to trust you with all of my life. Today and every day, I want you to take full charge of my life. Father in heaven, you've seen our hands go up across this auditorium. We're saying to you, Father, we want to trust in you fully. Today and every day, we want to be fully on your side because we know that you will prevail, that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, will overcome. We look forward to the day when you establish your kingdom. Make us part of that kingdom now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.